Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, so yes, thank you um, to Mark and the um, chapter here um, for inviting me to speak this afternoon. Um, we certainly are developing work in this area of giving voice to values, but it is based on an idea that originated in business by Professor Mary Gentile. Um, today, what I'm going to share with you is a brief summary of what giving voice to values is introduce you to the um, project that I was involved in with some of my colleagues at Munster Technological University, and um, then finally share some findings of a recent research study with you. Um, conscious of the time, I think what may be of most interest to people here is the findings of our study. So that's what I'm going to focus on today, but I have retained some of the slides that refer to the methodological rigor around that, and I'm happy to, you know, discuss that further with people at a later point, or if Mark or Geraldina um, want me to share any information to other members, um, be of them, I'm very happy to do that afterwards as well. So first of all, um, what is giving voice to values? Essentially, it's an action-oriented approach to values-driven leadership. It very much normalizes value conflict in the workplace. And that's one of the first things that I liked about this approach is that it says value conflict is something that happens for all of us very often in the workplace. And we need to develop practical skills about how to manage that. Um, it was pioneered in business ethics by Professor Mary Gentile. Um, a copy of her seminal text is on the right here from 2010. What's unique about giving voice to values is that it asks, asks rather new questions. It moves beyond the ethical awareness and ethical analysis point to say, once I have decided that I am going to act on my values and I have made a decision, what would I say and do and how could I be most effective? In terms of this interest, this is an ongoing interest for me in my area of work and research and teaching around um, research ethics and practice. The extent to which nurses actually have the ability to act as moral agents is always an ongoing question for me, both in my career as a registered nurse working in the area of renal dialysis, but also in nurse education. And nurses, like other professions, experience this dichotomy between, on the one hand, their obligations in accordance with their code of professional conduct, and on the other hand, the internal and external socio-cultural constraints that may actually prevent them from acting on their values in ways that they want to do so. And the paper that I've shared with you here is a paper from Lyshenko and Peter in 2016, where they trace the ongoing um, historical development in the literature around the idea of the extent to which nurses can be moral in practice. So that was my initial um, interest in the area of GVV um, when I came across um, a research paper that had actually applied Mary Gentile's work in their School of Nursing also, a paper by Lynn Chetag. So let's talk a little bit then about what makes um, GVV unique. And GVV very much operates in accordance with what Gentile says, the three flips. So first of all, it flips or it changes the idea of what we're talking about in a moral, ethical, or value-based context. So essentially, her what refers to the black and white issues. It's not focused on the what should we do. It's not focused on the analysis. It's rather focused in this post decision making phase. So the decision has been made. Who are we talking about? Gentelli, Gentelli tells us that giving voice for values is very much about the pragmatist. It's about the person who has decided what they want to do or say in regard to a value conflict, but realizes that there are going to be challenges ahead. And then finally, the how. It focuses on practical steps in regard to how can I get this done. 
Um, I can share these slides with you and share some resources with you that will further explain the basis of GVV, but I just want to summarize some key concepts. First of all, as already mentioned, it normalizes value conflict, which helps in the sense that it moves it beyond the remarkable to something that is commonplace and needs to be addressed on a day-to-day -day or at least regular basis. It's action oriented. As previously said, it moves beyond the typical ethical awareness, ethical analysis, application of moral theories that are typically taught to students in an ethics class and moves into the action space. OK, I've decided what I want to do. How can I do that? Evidence based in that it is based on the evidence around positive deviance and habit formation. It seeks to develop this moral muscle memory. So in other words, the more often that I act on my values, the more often that I practice or rehearse with regard to how to act on my values, the more likely I'm to do so. It's strengths based. It contains a number of um, reflective exercises that encourages us to think on the basis of our own strengths and develop our own toolkit in terms of what I can bring to the table when a value conflict arises. It also encourages us to perhaps think about some of our own limitations and how we might actually limit those in the context of the current conflict or the areas in which we are required to develop. It also very importantly acknowledges choice. And it very much distinguishes between what one may prefer us to do and what is actually in order. And I think that's very interesting in a nursing context as well. Um, this idea of realizing that I perhaps have more agency than I actually think I have. And I think instilling that in student nurses and indeed all nurses is very important. It's experiential. It very much also goes on the idea of performative ethics and asks individuals once they have decided what they want to do in the context of a value conflict to then script, develop scripts around that, actually writing out what am I going to say and then perhaps rehearsing those scripts with others in what is often referred to as peer coaching. Another key feature of GVV is that it deals with those frequent pushbacks. We've all been in a situation where we realize that something needs to be done here. Something isn't quite right here. And in some ways, this relates to the psycho psychological literature around cogn cognitive dissonance as well. I realize this is going to be challenging. So in some ways, perhaps I try and talk myself out of it. And Gentile talks about those reasons and rationalizations that we might apply that exist either internally or externally from others and gives us a series of levers that we can use in terms of minimizing those reasons and rationalizations. So having given some sense of what GVV is all about, I now want to share details of our um, of our project with you at MTU. Um, so the National Forum funded project um, educational funding that was acquired by our university for teaching and learning projects. And because of this interest in GVV, I came together with a group of my colleagues from the nursing department, but also engineering, social care and other academic and professional units across the college to develop a learning community and a project around GVV. Essentially over the course of the project, um, which occurred over a 12 month period, members of our learning community undertook an online program on GVV, one of those um, MOOCs or massive online courses um, that's provided free by the University of Virginia. And we discussed its application to our teaching and learning context in regular meetings. While you can access the program for free, if you do want to um, receive a certificate and get full exposure to all the minutiae of exercises, there is a fee, which I think is approximately 45 euros, 
but many of our members actually undertook the um, free option and that was sufficient for our um, purposes, which I think is also important to say. Um, the link here is to our um, project video, which I will share with you in the chat at the end of the presentation as well. So out of that learning community, I and two particular colleagues of mine, one who also works in the um, Department of Nursing and um, is a member of the um, local um, Sigma chapter, also Dr. John Farrell, but also Dr. Sean Lacey, who works in the area of um, research ethics and integrity in our institution. And I and these two colleagues designed a research project where we invited members of our learning community to take part. The purpose of the study was to explore personal reflections gained from participation in the Giving Voice to Values online program and capture insights to inform professional ethics, teaching and learning. We did obtain um, gatekeeper approvals from our registrar and ethical approval from our university's ethics committee. Um, I'm not going to take you through the literature in detail today, but I wanted to retain these slides just to note that there was um, rigor applied both at the literature review stage, but also in the study design and analysis phases. Um, our literature review and going through our um, Prisma focus took us from 149 to 14 peer reviewed papers. There is a growing body of empirical evidence that is supporting the use of GBV in formalized education con contexts, including nursing, um, which is a paper by Lynch et al. in 2013. Um, actually, Lynch's paper is one of those um, more discussion-based papers that includes locally-based um, evaluations, qualitative evaluations, that weren't necessarily part of a, um, a um, study per se. There are also um, two theoretical papers that we came across that review in a theoretical sense, the underlying um, basis of GVV as a teaching tool. Um, our study was based on our exploratory design with purposive sampling from our existing learning community we invited our members to maintain a diary, and um, then they submitted those diary entries into a Microsoft um, form at three points in time. After the first two weeks of the MOOC, after the third week of the MOOC, and after the fourth week of the MOOC. Um, analysis was carried out um, in accordance with Braun and Clark's approach. And um, the rigor and ethos of Braun and Clark was applied throughout all those stages. We were keen um, that in using NVivo as a um, software application that we saw its use was to store, organize and manage our study data. But the conceptual phases of Braun and Clark were applied throughout. Um, the researcher was actively engaged as Braun and Clark suggest um, the authors of this analysis approach abhor the phrase, the themes emerged as if they were just lying there on your desk for you one morning, as opposed to saying how important it actually is that the researcher is actively engaged in this process. A degree of reflexivity was also applied throughout, both through my personal journey and sharing of all stages of the research, including the thematic analysis with my co-researchers, co rather, Dawn and Sean. So that is to show that actually we did do the analysis on in vivo. And just to share then um, some of the key themes with you. Um, our three um, themes are associated with engagement and overall thoughts around um, GVV, how it is different, how it is similar. Um, insight in GVV, which contained both personal and teaching and learning insights, and finally application in GVV. Um, participants' thoughts around how GVV could be applied if they indeed decided that they were going to apply GVV locally, and how then we might adapt GVV for our local context. So just to give you some flavor of those findings, and I don't intend to go through all of them, 
or call out all of the quotations. Um, first of all, GVB is different. A real sense that it was providing a teaching tool to cross this decision action gap and was something clearly different in that regard. GVV is similar. Um, certainly, um, a number of colleagues saw echoes there of neuro linguistic programming, issues like mirroring, Edward de Bono's other people's viewpoints, and the quiet leader concept advanced. Um, by Vadarako and um, also echoes of appreciative inquiry um, very much come through in terms of the GVV approach. Um, GVV, the nub then, what it really meant to people, it focused on the action piece. People liked its pragmatic and practical approach and essentially saw it as a creative, non-confrontational and strengths-based approach. So that's, that's what people really felt um, about GVV at this engagement level. But then insights and where our research differs from some of the other published papers around this, thanks a million Mark, we are hoping to um, publish this research at a, a future point in time. That's one of the next steps with my colleagues. Um, but where this study differs in that it very much talks about the insights from the academics themselves in terms of engaging with the methodology and not just what the students thought, because we thought this was important for us to do this initially before we brought it to our students. Um, so personal insights, people did identify with the strengths-based approach. It could provide them with a list of strengths. It struck a chord with people, this idea of the reasons and rationalizations, why maybe you know, we don't act on issues. People could place themselves within this narrative. People liked the idea of normalization. And one member particularly talked about their own position and how it lacked authority, but that they felt they could use the levers within GVV, like rehearsal, pre-scripting, dealing with pushbacks in advance, et cetera, for ways in um, advancing their purpose in their own work life. From a teaching perspective, um, people liked its um, interactive idea, the importance of opening a dialogue, saw it as not a methodology that was set in stone, which indeed Mary Gentile attests to herself. It's like, here is this toolbox and do with it as you will, and was very open in that regard. People liked the idea of rehearsal, again, the action focused approach, the focus on choice and liked crossing the decision action gap. Um, in terms of the concerns, and I, you know, happy to say that um, it points to the robustness of the study in that it wasn't all seen as um, wonderful by our um, participants. Some people had concerns that maybe it wasn't situated enough in the regulatory context. Gentile talks about hyper norms. Um, one of our participants felt that as educators, we'd need to go a little bit further than that in terms of a local context and the regulatory systems within which students work. Um, then what about when the ethical becomes immersed, immersed rather with the legal um, context and what needs to be done around that in terms of mandatory reporting? And um, finally, which was a concern that I did share myself as well, a barrier that in a sense, um, we, the complexity of it might not be understood by students and that we do want to set them up to fail in a sense. Um, so that we need to explain to students that not every value conflict is going to work out wonderfully. And I think that's very important. So um, this is my second last slide that I'm going to share with you. Um, people certainly did intend to apply the pedagogy. In fact, I've already started doing so in some of my own ethics classes with good success. People like its pragmatism. Um, they saw it as a way to explore value conf or resolving conflict in general and not just moral or ethical conflicts. Um, People did see it as a useful generic tool, but noted that parts may not be applicable because some of the videos on the online MOOC, for example, are very much US based. And um, one of the participants um, did not like GVV as a tool 
and as this statement very clearly says, did not intend to apply it in their teaching. And I think that's fair to say of many pedagogical approaches that they won't be for everybody. But in the main, participants did see themselves applying GVV, but they did think it important that there were some adaptations. Developing um, discipline-specific case studies um, also realizing um, the importance of psychological safety for students and coaching them in that regard. And um, one of the participants also commented that they didn't think that the different contextual basis was a problem and actually saw that as a positive in terms of saying, how are things different and maybe engaging in a conversation about how ethics differs from culture to culture and context to context. Um, so finally, um, in our work, we found that GVV was pedagogically similar in many respects, but that it's action oriented, normalizing and strength based um, and experiential focus was distinctive. In summary, we found GVV to be a useful tool to augment or to add to our existing teaching around ethics and not necessarily replace it. We thought it a very flexible tool. Um, we do um, believe that it is important to consider legal, regulatory and cultural context and application. And already in teaching GVV to students, I'm setting it as the action piece in a wider um, ethical decision making model and um, being very clear to students perhaps about the limits of this and their own psychological safety in its application. So we're certainly moving on with this. Um, I'm excited about it, as indeed are a number of my colleagues. And we have received some additional funding from our teaching and learning unit in the university this year to develop some GVV context specific cases. And um, Gentile actually invites that. And we are entering into some conversations with her around that because a number of people internationally have developed um, their own cases for their own disciplines and regulatory context also. And um, we do think there's a need for further evidence around this. And I think the next step is perhaps um, a formal study um, where we um, teach students using a GVV approach or an adapted GVV approach and then doing some research around that, maybe something like quasi-experimental pre, pre and post test, looking at moral reasoning, et cetera, et cetera. So that is um, essentially where I wanted to bring you to today. I hope it's given a flavor of it. And just finally to um, acknowledge our funders. So I'll stop sharing my screen now and see if um, any of you have any. Thank you, um, Anne-Marie. Uh, absolutely fascinating, well done. Um, I think most people will uh, agree with uh, the opportunity to shine a light on all ped pedagogical approaches and especially new ones like this one. Uh, it can be quite inspiring. So for this, uh, for the purpose of, of today, we'll invite a couple of questions. Um, so uh, again, thanks, uh, Anne Marie. But if, does anybody have any questions uh, with, Anne uh, with, with Anne Marie in relation to this approach or the next steps? Um, that was great, Anna Marie. Thank you so so much. I was wondering. Um, have you seen this approach used uh, very much in internationally? Uh, are you thinking of collaborating with other colleagues to do some research? Um, yes, and indeed, at the um, uh, because I presented something similar to this, but in more detail at the um, nurse education um, and practice conference in Spain last week. And actually, already people have contacted me about collaborating on this. So right. it's it was a fantastic opportunity to do that. Um, I'm also, I suppose, up to this point, it was to get the analysis complete, get the work complete, get the presentation complete, move on to publication. But certainly I'm going to get in touch with um, Lynch, particularly who has done some of this area, some of this work in, in nursing already. Um, so I certainly see um, huge scope for collaboration around this. And my colleagues and I are actually opening up conversations around that at the moment. 
Thanks, Anne-Marie. Christina, I see your hand up there. I just wanted to say thank you very much, and it's very timely. We've got we're going to validation tomorrow for a new online MSc nursing program, and one of the modules, well, actually several of the modules that would work for, but one is about relational ethics and ways of working. And um, I just want to say thank you because I can say something. I'm, I'm going to steal from you the validation tomorrow and sound fairly um, knowledgeable, uh, but it, it will fit beautifully. And also, I have. Uh, so I'm looking at it from a very self-centered perspective that uh, I really enjoyed listening to your presentation and it really resonated for me. Thank you, Christina. And I mean, it's certainly it's right in that relational ethics um, space. So I certainly don't look at it as stealing. I look at it as sharing. And that's the that's the whole idea of these um, wonderful fora like this. And uh, I'm very happy to talk to you online about it. And there is a kind of a one pager that um, is available around GVV that summarizes it. And um, if you want to um, give me your email address or um, I'm, I'm very happy to um, send that um, to you, Christina. Yes, All right, you, you may have 